welcome to CultureCast. I'm Jenny. I'm Olivia. I'm Marley. I'm Johnny. I'm Drew. I'm Matt. I'm Vanessa. In this episode, we'll be talking about why Sargasso Sea. Where exactly is the Sargasso Sea? Well, we're actually talking about a novel by Jane Rice, but the Sargasso Sea is located in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. Oh, got it. Yes, but Jean was born in Rosa Dominica, West Indies, to her father that was a Welsh doctor and her mother a third-generation Dominican Creole of Scottish ancestry. Thanks to her outrageous mix of heritage and being a white Creole in the Caribbean and England, Rice felt like she never really belonged anywhere. Poor girl. That's interesting, because being mixed nowadays is pretty cool. Yeah, very true. But guys, things were different back then. Jean's first experience, Jean first experienced racial tension in 1834 when she took the side of the blacks after slavery ended, which earned her the nickname Socialist Squire. Jean then left the Caribbean to go to England for her education, but unfortunately dropped out of it after her father's passing. Who would ever want to leave the Caribbean? Haha, <laughs> unfortunately she had a pretty good reason. I'd say so. And even though Jean's great-grandfather was a slave owner, she always identified herself with the black community, but she knew she could never be the same as her nearest maids and black mentors. All of her life experiences came together and influenced her writing in general, but White Sargosso Sea almost acts like a window into Jean's childhood. A window? Yes, a window. But how? Allow me to explain. Jean created the character Annette Causeway as almost a mirror to herself. We are first introduced to Antoinette, a young girl in early 19th century Jamaica that lives on the Cabruli estate, an old plantation. And her father was an ex-slave owner who actually ended up drinking himself to death. How depressing is that? That's absolutely horrible. Antoinette then ends up living alone with her mom and sick brother Pierre, saying Antoinette's childhood was a little hostile is an understatement. The black community hated her family for being former slave owners, and the white community didn't want her to associate with them not only because they were poor, but also of Creole heritage. And her mom was French, again connecting to Jean's mom's heritage. See, window, told you. I know the story too, you know. I definitely agree with Marley. Antoinette spends most of her time alone because her mom doesn't find her a priority. So no home cooked meals or cuddle time? No, Drew, unfortunately none of that. Antoinette's mom, Annette, decides to marry a wealthy planter named Mr. Mason, who can uh, provide them with the financial support. This marriage causes more racial tension between Antoinette's family and the community that riots burn, uh, burn their house to the ground. Nearly everyone escapes except for Pierre, Antoinette's brother, who unfortunately passes away. Antoinette goes insane and shipped away by Mr. Mason. Antoinette is also uh, a way to live with her aunt Cora. What a lovely hubby. What a lovely husband and an even better stepdad. On top of all of it, Mr. Mason then arranges Antoinette to marry a man named Rochester. But don't worry, they have a picture-perfect honeymoon in Grandbois at the beautiful Causeway Estate. At first, the marriage is uneasy, but the two begin to t trust e each other until Rochester receives a letter from Daniel Causeway, Antoinette's cousin, who spills the family beans. Oh yes, Matt, that was a really rough situation. The letter stated of Antoinette's previous engagement to a colored relative and her unstable history of mental illness. This revelation causes Rochester to reject Antoinette, which then backfires since she drugs him using a potion her servant Christophine gave her and seduces him. In revenge, Rochester sleeps with Antoinette's maid, causing Antoinette to fall back into her instability. Wait, who is Christophine again? Christophine is the one who brought Antoinette into the culture of the Caribbean. Antoinette answers her, sort of like an authority figure. Christophine herself is an outsider, so she relates to Antoinette in her struggle to find herself. Even though she is a very loyal servant to the family, she somehow is the subject to most of the talk on the estate. Well, I wonder why. So after that incredibly romantic honeymoon, Rochester makes the decision to, obvious decision to lock up his wife in Field Hall. And where is this place, you might ask? All the way in England and guarded by this woman named Grace Poole. At this point in the novel, the reader begins to question whether or not she really is crazy. But that is all verified when her brother Richard comes to visit, since she is tempted to stab him. But don't worry, she settled for biting him instead. Jeez, I hope my relationship with my sister never gets so bad that she would want to stab me. Yeah, it's really unfortunate that it has gotten to this point. But it's also because Antoinette isn't really in the right mind. In the attic where she's kept, she has a dream that she escapes from the room and sets fire to the entire house, which is totally normal in itself. Then the novel ends with her actually escaping from her room, candle lit and all, as she walks down the hallway. Hey now, it can't be all her fault she's like that though. It has been said that madness runs in the family. And madness is actually one of the main motifs in the story. Having two crazy parents does not help the environment with which she lives. It only fuels her madness even more. 
Antoinette constantly feels rejected, pushing her to be paranoid and always having violent outbursts. But how about this, guys? So since when we realize Antoinette is mad, can we even trust any part of the story from her point of view? Part one, so the reader can witness how she grew up. But her story is full of gaps and secrets. She definitely chose what she wanted to remember and what she wanted to forget. But that's only human nature, right? I would give Antoinette a break. Life can't always be perfect, and so we all go a little crazy sometimes. Okay, a little crazy? She tried to kill her brother, let's not forget. And speaking of death and mental disease, these are two other motifs which contributed to who Antoinette is. Yeah, death definitely revolves around Antoinette's life. First Annette Torres, then Pierre, Annette herself, Aunt Cora, and Mr. Mason. Antoinette is all alone because everyone keeps dropping like flies around her. Also speaking of her mental disease, Antoinette shows signs early on. She shares a fascination with Christophine of the supernatural as well as superstitions that lead her to believe Annette is a zombie. You know, because that's what all moms end up being. That's just so weird. Tell me about it. Also, Antoinette and Rochester become deathly ill with fevers. Antoinette, for some reason, believes the cure is in England when the real novel is preparing us for her ultimate downfall. The Causeway family has a legacy of alcoholism, madness, and deformity. There was no way Antoinette had a chance for normalcy. But wait, let's go back a second here. Olivia, you talked about Antoinette's narration, and I thought it was really clever how Jean decided to split up the narration of the story. Yeah, I agree. I thought it was cool that we got to see the story from a whole other point of view when, when Rochester took over the narration in part two. The audience gets to enjoy the story from a different angle since Rochester's experience and relationships are exposed. I like to think Gene wanted the reader to feel connected to him. I completely agree, but did you guys notice that there were times where Rochester's voice varies? I think the tone of his voice depended on whether he wanted to come off as socially acceptable or if he would, if, or if he tried to hide his true self. That boy has got some secrets. He may have some secrets and be an interesting character and all, but did we forget about Grace Poole? Grace Poole has a little narration type thing in italics in part three, right before Antoinette, Antoinette's narration takes over again. We hear from Antoinette in this part to see the flow of perceptions, thoughts, and memories in her mad little head at the time. So is it just me or does everyone else love a good premonition? Oh, I love a premonition. Please explain. Well, there are a few symbols in this book that really foreshadow the ending that are hard to pick up on at first. Like when her parents' wings are clipped, this is totally a symbol of Antoinette's own flightless dependency. Also, when she sees a cock crowing outside Christophine's house, this foreshadowing foreshadows them some serious danger. Oh yeah, the forests and trees are a symbol too. When Antoinette has that dream that she is enclosed a uh, garden with tall, uh, dark trees. This is a premonition of her future captivity in England. It's all starting to make sense now. Also, the honeymoon estate is named Grand Bois, which translates to Great Forest. Even so, the name foretells her to move to the forests of England. Don't forget that the garden itself is a symbol, too. Antoinette compares the garden at Calabrini Estate to the biblical Garden of Eden due to its luxury size and loss of innocence. She states that the garden has gone wild and describes it. An orchard is being snaky looking, again referring to the Bible. Speaking of the Coulibri estate, that is one of the many settings in White's Art SOC. Yes, from the beautiful plantation in Coulibri to the desolate tropical house to the attic in England, Reese uses the setting to give distinct differences between all three major locations and meanings to each character. I wouldn't mind having a nice plantation mansion. I could use a vacation. Me too, except I think I would rather go somewhere a bit more tropical. Speaking of which, the setting gives the reader the initial Creole feel that later conflicts with the white folk that do not approve of Antoinette or her family. The large estate also gives you the information about her financial background. She's clearly not poor and money has never been a problem in her life. Yeah, and as Antoinette continues to crumble day by day, her setting continues to become more and more isolated. From the desolate uh, Grand Boys estate with her uh, husband and her financial isolation in the attic, her final isolation in the attic, in England where she can truly lose everything about herself. It's incredible to see how a person who has so much can fall so hard, but there is also something to be said here about the community. The communities could be defined between race and social status. There was a community between all the servants since they are working for someone else for a little pay. There's also a community between all the dark-skinned people and between the light-skinned people. And there's a sub-community within Antoinette's family in the sense that they are all within the social class. Also, they share the same discrimination with the uh, peers by considered with the white end. So, where does Antoinette fit in? I'm glad you asked, Marley. Antoinette is also part of another sub-community between her and her half-siblings. In addition to that sub-community, there is one between the slaves who don't identify themselves to be Jamaican. There is also another sub-community between Colibri servants and separate sub-community between Grand Boy servants. One could argue that there is a sub-community between the servants 
who help Antoinette in her distressed days. Furthermore, there is also a community between the Brits. What about the moral and cultural content? It has to fit in somewhere. Key aesthetic elements in the novel Wide Cigars at Sea include highly descriptive text, similes throughout, the author's diction, motifs, symbols, and imagery. That sounds like a lot of figurative language and literary terms. It really is. In terms of the form and content of the novel, Wide Cigars at Sea is from the eyes of Antoinette and Mr. Rochester. They describe events that occur from their perspectives at different times in the novel. The first person narrator will switch between these two people so that the reader can understand what they're thinking. That's exactly right, and just a brief overview of the content as it is as follows. Young Antoinette struggles to connect with her mother after her father, Mr. Cosway, died. Antoinette gives her thoughts on how she has been treated by others, usually being ridiculed and mistreated by her peers. She draws comparisons from the reader because of how innocent she seems combined with the ways her peers mistreat her. However, the cultural context of the novel is about slavery ending after 1834 on the island and, saves and slaves gaining freedom. What about the characters? They weren't all changed throughout the novel? Yes, all the characters were extremely important and they all had their moments. Antoinette is derived from Jane Eyre, so the wide cigar so see uh, shows the events leading up to what she would become in Jane Eyre. Yeah, that's true, John. In the beginning of the novel, she was a young girl living in Jamaica, and as it went on, she experienced many uh, mental and emotional blows, which led, her to, which led to her decline as a human being. She didn't really know where she belonged to her community because she had the Creole ancestors but grew up in the Caribbean and adopted that culture. And when she was very isolated as a child and forced into an arranged marriage that she didn't want any part of, when she uh, married her husband, they could not relate to each other at all. Antoinette was extremely important to the novel, but my favorite character was Christophine. She really stood up for herself and didn't take crap from anybody. Christophine is the one who brought Antoinette into the culture of the Caribbean. I liked her too. She is who Antoinette answers to, sort of like an authority figure. She herself is an outsider, so she can relate to Antoinette with not knowing who she is. She is a servant but is loyal to the family, yet she still is the subject of all the bad talk in the house. Although relating to Antoinette in some ways, she is completely different in the fact that she remains independent from a man. Definitely. She even advises Antoinette to leave her husband when he questions her well-being. And yeah, Mar Marley, I agree. Christophine didn't take garbage from anybody, especially Antoinette's husband, Rochester. He remains nameless throughout the novel, but speaks his views in the third part. He tells his own side of the downfall of Antoinette. He is the arranged husband and renames Antoinette Bertha and continues to change her identity as he finds out more about her. He sees that she is crazy and treats her as if he isn't there towards the end. Not my kind of man. Plus, he sounds like a real pain in the... Speaking of sound, what about the tone in the novel? The tone in White Sargasso Sea is dark and weird. Throughout the book, Reed's description of Antoinette's ravaged hopes, uh, life, hopes of social superiority. It almost seems like Reese wanted the reader to get depressed reading this book. The tone gives a sense that things were never going to be better. Not until halfway through the story is the reader given some hope. But before the paragraph is even over, there begins to be questions of self-doubt. All in all, the tone is dark and gives the reader a sense that for the characters, their best days are behind them. And the speech and dialogue, how does that fit in? The speech and dialogue is important to this novel because it is being told from a character's point of view. The way certain people speak gives the reader an idea where that person is from. Different phrases and dialects shows that people speaking are from the Caribbean, using broken English, and the people who speak proper English are the people who are perceived to be English settlers. The language used marks a place in their community. What about the time frame? It's not like this, this book play, took place in the Stone Ages or modern era. Well, you're very much correct, John. It didn't take place during or, or near either of those time frames. In the w novel Wide Cigars to Sea, the time frame is somewhere sometime after 1834, the 19th century, during social and political upheaval in British Jamaica, right? Yep, because the Emancipation Act had been passed in 1833, which promised slaveholders compensation for freeing their slaves. Thank you. Also in the novel, Antoinette's father, Mr. Cosway, and her neighbor, Mr. Luttrell, never receive payment and are ruined financially. In part two, the novel moves to Granboys in Massacre, Dominica. Dominica is known as having been fought over by the British and French. And then the novel ends in Thornfield Hall, England, where Antoinette is disgruntled and kept locked in an attic by her husband. It's easy to get lost in the timeline of the novel due to the skipping around of point of views, so we're never given access to the truth of what actually happens from an outside perspective. This was a ton of information even for me to take in, let alone the audience. 
So what are the main ideas that we should really recall from this novel? Wide Sagasso Sea represents the theme post-colonialism because it gives insight to the troubles of a Caribbean woman. By giving insight to a character by another European author, race is given this character's a more personable approach. And by doing so, she says, sheds the light on a minority group that would before have gone unheard. Rise gives a voice to Bertha from Jane Eyre, who is completely voiceless before. This prequel to Jane Eyre gives the reader an idea of the hardship Antoinette has gone through. We talked about Jane Eyre quite a bit, but how does White Sargosa Sea relate to other novels? I found the storyline of White Sargosa Sea to be similar to that of Pocahontas. While there are many differences between the two stories, there are a couple of similarities. While it was different in White Sargasso Sea where the marriage was forced, in Pocahontas the marriage between John and Pocahontas was real, but when John tried to bring Pocahontas back to England to have her adjust to society there, compared to her home in an Indian village, she ultimately gets sick and dies. Yes, and similarly in White Sargasso, Antoinette goes even more crazy when her husband brings her to England away from her home in Jamaica. Once taken away, she begins to have dreams of burning the house down. I think this conveys an overall theme in both stories of being pulled from your home is ultimately too stressful. Also, the story of why Sagar So C is a pre equal slash response to Jane Eyre. So it really wraps up quite nicely. So there you have it, folks. Signing off from Culture Cast is Jenny. This is Olivia. Marley. John. Drew. And Matt. Have a fantastic day.